and thank you, uh, Linda and the SIA, for the opportunity to talk about one of my favorite organizations and certainly my favorite bird, the uh, Osprey. Uh, I do want to take the, uh, the opportunity to just briefly tell you about the Fisher Club and some of the things we do that you may not be aware of. Uh, first of all, we 175 members, as it says there, founded in 1985. We meet seven or eight times a year where mostly what we do is drink beer and tell lies. <laughs> and we're pretty good at it. Uh, we're probably best known for uh, Nightmare that prayed in August uh, that, uh, where we really show our stuff. And, uh, and all I can tell you is it peaks growing up. But, uh, you have to assure you I, that we fish. And uh, we fish <laughs> We have uh, seven annual tournaments and uh, we emphasize catch and release and probably our best attended and best known tournament is the kids surf tournament that we have in August where we put 150 youngsters out on the beach. It's uh, organized chaos. We give them uh, bait, we give them uh, fishing tackle, uh, we have uh, judges and umpires and awards and hot dogs and sodas and it's a great show. <laughs> but we do take time off sometimes and we recognize where we live and uh, our precious island and we make an effort to give back and uh, that effort in the environmental projects that we have some of you have participated with us over the years in our beach maintenance projects Carl Ferguson <laughs> runs it we've put up hundreds if not thousands of feet of beach uh, of dune fence I don't know how many uh, thousands of dune grass plants we put in. And lately, the last year or two, uh, Carol's been emphasizing native species. We educate. <laughs> Over the years, the uh, club has, has brought in various organizations, including the Wetlands Institute, Mammal Stranding Center, the American Littoral Society, conserve wildlife and numerous uh, state and federal elected representatives. The slide here is uh, Turtle Night at the Shivo. Uh, Rosemary Whalen brought in the, uh, the Wetlands Institute last week. We had over 100 people down at the uh, Shivo where uh, youngsters get a chance to learn about the Diamondback Terrapin, the one that crawls across our roads and they get a little touchy-feely and they even get to put some uh, turtles back in the bay. <laughs> Probably the toughest and most challenging program that we run is the, uh, the Ocean Reef Program. It's, uh, uh, Randy Roach runs it, uh, and I'm going to read this because it, it's significant and I don't want to take too much time. But the club has sponsored 14 significant uh, deployments that focus on reefs just off of Strathmere, usually somewhere between three and five miles off. Uh, it's, it's a tough program. We have to coordinate with state and local agencies, and there, it takes a lot of resources. Randy, over the years, outside resources, he's raised over $50,000 to put stuff into the ocean. And uh, what it does, it provides a, a habitat for just numerous uh, ocean uh, animals. That's enough of that. Okay. <laughs> that there is uh, an osprey. It's an osprey carrying my favorite fish. <laughs> okay, disclaimer. I'm not a biologist. I think most people know where I come from. What I say here tonight is what I've been looking at for the last 20 years and what I've learned and, and read about. So if I make a mistake or if I pass some bad piece of information, it's unintentional. The bird, he's about two feet long, wingspan is five to six feet. The amazing statistic, he only weighs two to four pounds, usually around three pounds. The female is a little larger than the male. Normal lifespan is 20 years. There have been records of, uh, of bandit birds living up to 30 years. Uh, they mate for life, however they do not migrate together. 
uh, we, I think we would say separate vacations. Uh, they return to the same nest each year. In Strathbury, it's usually mid-March to April that they're here. Uh, after the legs are laid, uh, laid it's incubation in about uh, seven weeks, a little longer. We have uh, babies or chicks the first week in June. And uh, seven to eight weeks after that, we're getting the first flight. If you do the math, that we're just about into that area right now. We got young birds that are just doing their first flight. It's really neat. The female does most of the uh, incubation, however, the male does sit on the eggs and from time to time takes care of the kids. But of course, at the same time, the male provides most of the child. I'm going to play a film clip now if I can screw with my computer and make it work. And I'm going to show it three minutes long. I'm going to show it to you and not say anything. And then I'm going to show it again and I'm going to point out some things that I've been watching. Now, this is going to be tough. Okay. <clears throat> Ready? Why isn't it going? Okay. Sometimes I don't understand computers. Just watch it. It's uh, three or four sessions of Osprey's fishing. And it's all in slow motion, which is great. See, uh, I'm going to play it again and just make some comments. There's nothing graceful in the way they fish. I mean, it is uh, pretty violent. Uh, they're, they're definitely uh, hungry. This guy, or I'm sure it's a male, he's got more fish than he likes. I mean, he really would like to have a smaller fish. He tries several times. This next time, if you watch, you'll see the fish is actually not cooperating. He's uh, wiggling and flopping around down there and giving the bird, giving the bird a hard time. Uh, I don't know why, why do I have that thing up the next Okay. 
he finally gets airborne. And uh, there's, once again, it's nothing but uh, just sheer force. Feet come first, the towns are out, and this guy gets a fish that he suspects he would uh, like to be a little, uh, a little smaller. Remember, the bird weighs about three pounds, and I, I, I feel confident that fish is more than three pounds. But he's, uh, he's uh, uh, all the way. Watch the tail. The tail provides lift. I, I saw that, and I just couldn't believe it. how he used the tail as part of his, uh, his you know, uh, secure lift. He's got the fish with one toe. Yeah. <laughs> it's curved, it's very sharp, and it has barbs, and it'll hold the fish. But what he's trying desperately to do is get the other claw on him and get him aerodynamic. And as you see, as he goes through there, I don't think he gets it this time. The next time, he reaches down. He finally gets him. And, uh, now, I'll tell you what. If you, if you go down to the beach at 6 o'clock in the morning, I've been, I do that a lot. Invariably, I'll see at least one, if not more, osprey flying back from the ocean, carrying fish just like that. Pretty neat. So, <coughs> he's got dinner. This, this film clip is great because of the slow motion. I've never seen a bird catch more than one fish. I've seen him do this surface fishing, but I've never seen this, uh, the, this clip right here, where he picks up four or five fish. I think that's pretty classy. <laughs> And of course, this one, this one is just super. What I want you to do, okay? There's our, there's our uh, target. Is, uh, and he's fat, dumb, and happy. Biggest guy in the block. He doesn't have a threat. But I want you to watch during this thing. Watch the bird's head. He never moves. His wings are going to tuck. He's beginning to bring his talons out now. They'll come out further. And but his head never moves. He keeps it right on the target. He's got problems coming down. He's got dive angle, he's got airspeed, he's got altitude, he's got to get his feet out in time, and he's got a brain that's about as big as my thumb. I mean, and, and I just find it, I, I, just, I just get all worked up with it. Okay, here we go. Look at his talents. There's a great shot of him. See how they're curved? Yeah, and how they grab you. Okay. Head never moves. Right on, right into the water. The head never moves. Think the, think the flounder was surprised. <laughs> <laughs> and how far can they see? I'm, I'm sorry, I just want to show you the one thing here while we got it going. How flexible their wings are as soon as he starts flopping them. Right here. Yeah. Look at that wing. Yeah. I mean, isn't that something? Yeah. I'm sorry, what was the question? How far can they see? How far can they see? Yeah. Gee, I don't know, they can see a lot better than any of us, and I don't know how they see fish in the water like that. I mean, they're, you know, they're, they're typical birds of prey. They're raptors, which have great, uh, okay, now, where everything goes well, I can get back to where I was before. That's okay. <laughs> Next slide. Migration stuff. I mentioned earlier that the, uh, the chicks, just begin to fly this time. And by the end of July, most of them are flying. Uh, the parents hang around during August, uh, ensuring that the, the babies can feed themselves and take care of themselves. And pretty much by the end of August, mom and pop are going. Uh, the young hang around through September. If you see birds into October or November, they're usually transients, they're not from here. Most of them are out of here by the end of September, or early October. They all head south. Most of them head to South America. Some stop in Cuba, some stop in Santo Domingo, and, or even Florida occasionally. Most of them head down to uh, South America, even all the way down to the Amazon Basin. This particular bird was a female. She was three months old. She has no compass. She has no altimeter. She has no airspeed. And she found her way from Massachusetts, walked, worked on down through Maryland, and uh, stopped in uh, the Carolinas, got something to eat. Big overwater flight to the Bahamas. Stopped in the Bahamas, ate some more. 
over to Hispaniola, took off in the evening, flew all night and the next day down to Venezuela, and then uh, made her way down to French Guiana where she spent the winter. The uh, young will, uh, where's my notes here? The young will uh, remain uh, for two seasons. They won't come back the first season. They'll stay down there for about 18 months before they return. And of course, mom and pop will come back uh, next March and start the evolution all over again. Okay, the platforms. Uh, just a little history. Like several things in this town, it was initiated by uh, Karen Mitchell when she owned Whale, uh, Whale Creek Marina. And Karen uh, directed me, or commissioned me, whatever you want to say, to build her a platform where she could see nesting osprey. So I did that, and uh, I did some research, and did one, and I'll show you a picture of it. And uh, it was successful. First year we had birds on it, and she said, build me another one. Uh, <laughs> Herbie just walked in, and I, I built the second one, and I recruited her to help me put it up, and we got to talking and we went to the fishing club and they supported it. So since then we've uh, added 24 platforms and uh, number 27, I just hope you saw it, was sitting out in the uh, ramp and number 28's back at the house and they'll both go in tomorrow. So that's where we are on platforms. Locations. There should be 26 dots there. Uh, give you a little orientation. I do it. Yeah, okay, maybe. All right, we're right about here. Here's Strathmere, here's our bridge. Here's the Rush Chatham Bridge. This platform right here, I'm gonna point it out. I'll we'll talk about it later. You can see it uh, when you, before you go across the bridge, it's uh, right, up, right up to the left there. And it's a, uh, you can see it pretty easily. Uh, the rest of them are concentrated in around uh, Whale Creek, Flat Creek, and uh, the uh, main channel intercoastal waterway there. Uh, two more go in the bar. We're still, Herb and I are still fussing about where we're going to put it. One's going to go right here for sure, maybe right. one right over here. We're, we're, we want to put one across some twisties, so we, we've had some problems. We had some problems with that area. Okay. Losses. We, uh, over the years, and uh, this started I think in 2001. Over the years, we've lost three platforms, two, two to hurricanes, and one to a, a boat that broke loose and, uh, during a storm and took out one of the platforms. Moves, this is something that, uh, a learning process we had. Uh, the birds like to be the highest place. Their platform has to be the highest thing. They don't want trees around it or anything higher. Uh, and the other thing, they don't like to be near other nesting birds, particularly big nesting birds like the black, uh, black back gulls or the uh, herring gulls. So we did that in a couple, two, two different places, and we ended up moving the platforms. And when we moved them, quite frankly, we had birds on them within a day. So we're getting a little smarter. One of the bad places was right across from Twisties, and it was because of the nesting birds that used to be there, but they're not there any longer. So we're thinking about going back. Okay. The platform itself, uh, oh, how do I do that? There. This is, uh, I think it's the same one you got out front there. Uh, it's uh, 42 inches uh, a square, uh, and it's mounted on a six by six that is 14 feet long. Uh, we use treated lumber, it's a non-arsenic type, it's pretty environmentally friendly, and all galvanized and stainless steel hardware, et cetera. It weighs, uh, I estimate it weighs about 300 pounds. Uh, the, yeah, the, the six by six is big heavy. Uh, so it takes four of us to, to move it, we just, when we load it. Uh, ground transport, as you saw, was on a uh, standard boat trailer, we just strap it on there. And we use a, a Boston whaler with no uh, bow rails that we can get it on. As a matter of fact, the six by six starts out at 16 feet. I cut it down to 14 feet just to fit on the boot. <laughs> okay. We, we select the site 
based on homeless birds, what I refer to as homeless birds. And as most of you know, I, I'm out on the water usually before the sun is up and before the birds start flying. And there, there are a number of homeless uh, osprey paired that are on mainly intercoastal markers, usually trying to build a nest, looking for some place to uh, have chicks. And then when I see them, I try to put a platform near there, and they'll jump on it. We, it's not unusual for us to, to have birds on the platform within the day after we put them up. Uh, we, after we select the site, we get everybody out there and with a four foot, basically a four foot hole. I get uh, six to eight gorillas, as you see right there. And they, uh, they, uh, managed to get it in the hole and we uh, tamp it in. We have some supports we put on it. And we've been pretty lucky. Uh, we lost a couple to hurricanes, but mostly they, they hold up pretty well. Okay, there's, there's our crew. As you can see, uh, uh, we got young, we got old, we got male, we got female, we even have a dog. You know? <laughs> and that's typically what we have out there, somewhere around that many people. And, uh, and that's what it takes to put them up. It's, pretty, it's a nice time. Okay. The new and the old. Okay, the top left is my very first platform. That's the one I built for Karen uh, across from Whale Creek. It has had birds on it now for 17 years. Wow. Wow. And uh, I suspect it's the same birds. I, and they, they have to be getting old. Uh, and you can see the difference between the, uh, uh, the two, the new design, uh, I put arms on it mainly as a, as a uh, uh, landing point for the birds. It gives the uh, young birds a place to, to practice their flying. And, and uh, of course, they're tired. And in uh, 2012, the wildlife people, New Jersey wildlife people, came to us and asked us to change to a six by six instead of a four by four that I was using as a post. And they actually put ladders up on these things and they went and banned the birds and they were a little uncomfortable on the four by four. <laughs> so we do that. And we think it's a better platform anyway. <clears throat> Big and small. It is, uh, some birds just can't get enough stuff. I mean, <laughs> these, these two platforms are, are very similar in age, probably within a year of each other. They're, they're very successful. Both of them have birds on them each year and babies each year. And one on the left, they, every year they come back, they add another six or eight inches of stuff. <laughs> and you can see that those arms that are up, uh, they're three feet long. So you can see how you know, he's over the top of it, and uh, I don't know what he's going to do next year. <laughs> but uh, uh, the uh, and other birds, uh, as you see there, they're just the basic necessities, and they they both work the same. Okay. Uh, birds. Th this photo bag hang in there. The bag was on this platform for over a month. I have no idea how the birds got it there. I had no idea how it, how it stayed there until the winds took it off. Uh, we find fly squatters. We have found one of their favorites is the police do not cross tape. I don't know where they are. <laughs> uh, and of course, as you would suspect, numerous plastic bags that they, they, they find in the marshes. But it's interesting what they uh, can put up on, on our platform. Other birds. What we have here is a peregrine falcon family. And for the last four years, we've had peregrines on one of our platforms. Not always the same platform, but on one of the platforms. Here we have a mom, she's in the foreground, and the three chicks who have not started to fly, really. And uh, you have no question you were going to have to go through her to get to those chicks. In the meantime, this particular platform is one of the few that you can get very close to with the boat. Uh, Dad was uh, ready to take me out. He was uh, just raising all sorts of cane overhead. Uh, 
I guess the reason that peregrines are there, normally they're a city bird or they're on bridges, but when you think about it, all they eat are birds, other birds. And the marsh is a target rich environment for them. There, there's just all sorts of birds, young birds, old birds, hatch birds, all sorts of things. So I would imagine that's why they're there. Uh, I pr would prefer them not to be there, but there's nothing we can do about it. The other visitors we have, it is kind of interesting, and it doesn't happen until after the ospreys leave, and that's as you'll find bald eagles on these platforms. And uh, I mentioned that one up by the Rush Chatham Bridge, which is the one that has them most of the time. So, uh, and they won't, they won't go on the platforms where the osprey are here. So in October, November, even in the wintertime, and you're going across to Rush Chatham Bridge, just take a look over to the left. If you see a bird with a big white splotch on its tail, that's a bald eagle. And they're bigger than the osprey, too. All right, as you suspect, or maybe you suspect, I'm kind of like Randy. We don't pay for this either. <laughs> uh, each one of our platforms is dedicated to, <coughs> dedicated to someone. And we, uh, we offer that out to uh, the residents that they, they can, uh, they can uh, sponsor a platform. You can't buy it, it belongs to the birds. But uh, you can sponsor it, we'll put this little plaque on there, and each one is out there. The, the two, two platforms we're putting in this year are already spoken for. If you, uh, if you have an interest in doing something like that, please contact me. Next year, first come, first serve, it, it usually goes pretty, pretty quick. It, it's a nice program, and it, uh, and it helps the fishing club, helps the birds. Uh, one thing you should <laughs> keep in mind that if you ever donate any money to the fishing club, it goes into the environmental fund and not into our beer fund. <laughs> <laughs> we, we do keep that separate. Uh, the dues that we pay and the, quite frankly, the money we make on Nightmare is enough to keep us in beer for a year, so uh, that's okay. And the other thing to keep in mind is that we're a 501c3, so anything you give is, is fully tax deductible. And to finish it off, success. That platform is, in, is about an hour old, and it has a bird on it. Oh, wow. And, uh, and he was waiting for his mate to show up, and, uh, and they ended up, uh, you know, starting to build the nest. They'll, what they'll do with these platforms we put in, they'll start building this year, come back next year and have a family. So if you have any questions, I'll probably do a tap dance and try to get around it, but. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so. Yeah, they do. They, we, we've had we've had them from time to time. There, there'll be two pair that want to get on there, and they'll. I, I don't. I've never seen them clash with each other, but they they do dive and you know scream and shout at each other. And somebody finally. Yeah, one of them finally gives up. Yeah. The other thing is, how deep do they dive? I mean, I don't know. I, I you know the, that that flounder was no more than three feet under the water. That's yeah. for sure. And no, they they don't they don't go much deeper than yeah. that. Uh, yeah. The flounder flick is really, really spectacular. Yeah. 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 Yes, sir, Bob. Where is the current uh, falcon practice? The, the peregrines this year on the, do you, you know what I call Seagull Creek? It goes from Flat Creek to the main channel. Okay. You know, that little, that straight thing. Yeah. Uh, the peregrines are in there. There's a pair of them in there. I don't think they're nesting this year, but they're on the platform. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you go in there, you can tell them right away their wing flaps real quick and, uh, you know, they're an interesting bird. I've never seen them, I've never seen them uh, in real life, uh, you know, catch another bird. But I've seen pictures of it. Man, they, I mean, they, they, they poor pigeons are flying around the city. They just explode, you know. <laughs> yes, sir. So, um, they returned, they returned to the same place. They return to the, uh, yeah, we're, we're, yeah, I've been told that they're, they're, that pair comes back to the same platform each year. All right, so now they have two or three or four chicks to take off, and where do they go? Do they go back to the same location, do you think? In other words, are they Oh, you mean the chicks? The chicks, yeah. Uh, I think they come back to the same area. They, you know, mom and dad certainly wouldn't let them on that platform. Yeah, well, if you, <laughs> yeah, but if you go, I guess I'm trying to figure the numbers here, so yeah. you've got, 24 platforms, you've got 24 pairs, 
each one of those 24 has, we'll say, average of two chicks. Now all of a sudden, just double your population, where are they going to go? Well, yeah, that's why we build platforms. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're homeless for a couple of years. Well, they're, they're, yeah, they are, and, they, and uh, it's uh, interesting because there's, uh, the, the osprey population is up all around the world. But I didn't mention osprey or the uh, second most widely distributed uh, raptor in the world. The, the peregrine is the most rap, uh, most widely distributed. They're on every continent except Antarctica. Uh, but uh, uh, where were we? I can have Get something. Me. Did you, did you notice the uh, migration migration route and the time of the year? August, September, October, down through uh, down through the Bahamas and uh, right. that area. So there's so there pretty good attrition on the uh, you know, migration, yeah. But there will still be more. I mean, yeah. There's still more. The, the, the osprey population is way up. Yeah. In, yeah. in fact, it's up so far in the Chesapeake Bay area that they are not uh, normally they're sexually active but of three to four years. And they're not, uh, they're not getting that way in the Chesapeake Bay area until seven or eight years because they can't find a place uh, to uh, nest and, and have a family. Uh, yes, sir, and Mr. Do you get grief from the state folks or the wildlife folks? Do you get grief or you get support? Uh, or no. indifferent? Well, I, I think they're indifferent now if they got their six by six. I, I quite frankly, there, there's one gal, and she's she's really a nice lady that does it. Uh, but I'll be frank with about the banding. The banding just tears these birds apart. You go up there, and you grab the a baby, and these, the two mom and dad just go bonkers. And, uh, and and I'm not sure what they get out of it. You know, the band has colors. It says it comes from Jersey and whatnot, but they really don't know anything about it until they find the bird and, they, and that's right after it's dead. And how many do they find?